Well, the top 25 matchup is in the books here at Kyle Field. Texas A&M dominates number nine Missouri 41 to 10. And I'm joined here by with Travis Brown. And Travis, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, were you surprised at all with the outcome of this game? Well, if you, yeah, on this week's uh, Aggie Game Day Extra podcast, I called a Missouri win, so I was very surprised. <laughs> I was surprised Connor Wigman was uh, back there at quarterback, even though I know we'd heard some rumblings that he was back in practice. And uh, I was uh, surprised that the offense clicked that well. You know, he's a guy who has been injured several times in his career, and there's been times when he's come back that he's been a little bit rusty. If he was going to go, I thought, you know, it might be a little bit of a slog. And I, I haven't seen an AM offense move this efficiently in a really long time. Uh, maybe, maybe, and you know, you could argue the 2020 season, but at times that wasn't necessarily a super efficient offense. This was something, something to behold. Uh, and so, yes, to answer your question, I was, I was kind of surprised all around. I was about to say, given the opponent, and again, you know, maybe we don't know exactly how good Missouri is, but yeah, given the opponent and what we saw today. This might be the best offense, the most efficient offense I've seen since I've, I've been here. Because, yeah, my mind kind of goes to 2020. Uh, but even then, I mean, uh, and you could see right from the opening drive when Connor Wigman was comfortable. And he took the reins. Uh, and he just kind of uh, – it's the Connor Wigman that we've seen glimpses of and that we thought he was capable of. But we actually saw it on full display uh, here, here today. Yeah, and it was, you know, a lot of criticism in the past went to some of the offensive line, some of the wide receivers for not getting separation. I thought the game plan was called great to help those wide receivers get separation. A lot of comeback routes, uh, you know, a couple of those balls that probably were thrown a little bit short by Wegman were, were ended up being pretty perfect because the receivers were coming back for the ball. Uh, really thinking about that Jade Walker catch yeah. over the top of the defender. That was a pretty special play. Uh, but it was just all around good offense. Um, for the most part, really accurate from Connor. The running backs uh, were excellent. The offensive line was great, and the receivers uh, really separated themselves. And that, that's not even like touching on the defense yet. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, we'll I will get there. Right. <laughs> but um, it's one of those things where uh, this kind of proves why Connor has been the starter and listed as a starter all along. You know, there's been a lot of questions the last few because Marcella started and won three games in a row. Um, but Connor continues to be on the depth chart ahead of him, and it's always a game-time decision if he's healthy. Well, we saw him healthy, and I don't think you get this kind of performance if Connor is not uh, under center. I think Connor fell victim to the fact that AM scheduled a tough opponent in the first game of the season. It was something that they haven't done in a really long time in this program, and he came out and he didn't do well in, against Notre Dame in that tough first game battle. And that becomes the the baseline for the season, even though what Mike Elko has said all along is that the baseline for Connor Wigman is a lot higher. That was the exception, not the rule. I think at least today, Connor proved that, again, that that is the exception, not the rule. He was sharp, and for how much pain and, and rehab he's had to do to get that shoulder right, he was not afraid to run the ball and take some hits, too. You, you, you might, you know think back at all the rehab, all the time out he's had and say, yeah, you know, maybe I won't, maybe I won't run that or maybe I'll run it out of bounds or slide real early. And he was taking hits. That impressed me as well. It, it seemed like they set the tone early and just kind of fed off the energy. And it just, it just was like a snowball effect uh, mm -hmm. for, for this offense. Now, and, and well, and this is the important part too. He completed 81% of his passes. I mean, it was accuracy that was the biggest issue in the Notre Dame game. 81% is the second highest he's had in his career, and it was the highest against a conference team. The other one was against Louisiana Monroe a, a couple of years ago. So he was very, very accurate uh, in, in those throws, which I think is doubly impressive for where he's been. So we move defensively. I mean, this was overall just a complete dominate, dominating effort from AM. You couldn't pick just the offense, just the defense, because I feel like the defense played just as well as we saw from, from this offense. There were times where I thought we were looking at a shutout. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had struggled, Missouri did, to, to cross the 50-yard line. Uh, is this the best defense we've seen uh, this year? Is this the best we've seen them? I, I think it is, especially on the defensive front. Those guys were flying around. I think the way I put it in my uh, game rundown was that uh, Nick Scorton has squatters rights in the Missouri backfield <laughs> from now on uh, because he goes in behind the, the offensive line so much. But the, I, I did give in my kind of position grades the defensive secondary a C plus because there were two major blown coverages that should have probably resulted in two touchdowns. Uh, one in the first half that 
was the the a, a Luther mad, Burden. The it was Luther the, Burden, yeah. and he went down and ended up being a, a, an eligible uh, uh, blocker downfield and uh, illegal blocker. And then the second one was the touchdown in the second half. Yeah. If you get into a close battle against Texas, against LSU, something like that, in one of the closer game, two blown coverages on touchdowns like that can cost you the game and so yes they were really really good for the majority of the game but they've still got to work out some of those uh wide receiver handoffs when they're in zone coverage it plagued them on that big touchdown run against arkansas and there was a couple of those times that happened again that being said i still think yeah it was probably the most complete defensive performance right well and yeah like you said a game like this those bone coverages doesn't really matter as much in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things but yeah you're, you're in those close games and, and they might so c plus for the secondary uh nick scorton in that defensive front what kind of what kind of grade do, do they get in the that they they got an a plus i mean that was the it, it, brady cook was constantly under pressure he was constantly having to roll out of the pocket i mean even in that one touchdown play where there was a little bit of a blown coverage he stepped up and uh, uh, was, the, and the whole defensive front stepped up and got in there and got into Brady Cook's face, and he had to roll out. There might have even been a little bit of the holding on that play, but uh, yeah, they did a really good job of putting a lot of pressure and forcing them to to scramble and, and make some check downs and different reads. What impressed me too was the the um, the. The variety that they, they were showing on defense. It, Nick Scorton had an excellent game, but it wasn't just Nick. You know, they, they, they had a lot of people getting involved and showed really the depth of that defense. Um, and, and thinking of Nick Scorton, the, it's happened a couple of times now, but he, he had a sack on a third down, a couple of big ones. Um, coming right at my camera, and, and John Wilson, who used to work here at KBTX Sports, he texted me because I guess they – they saw it. He saw it on the on the game broadcast. And he goes, "Hey, it looks like uh, Nick Scorton came, came right at your camera." And was I was like, "Yeah, he he's one of the best uh, uh, celebrators, I think, after after my, sex." My grades usually I look at the stats. Your grades are how does they, it, it? How did it look on, uh -huh, on the camera? Exactly. I, I appreciate that. E exactly. <laughs> well, that's why we have on these home games, especially. I have multiple cameras, so we can see who gets that that, that good shot. Um, but yeah, it was just a overall um, just dominating performance. So. I think the two things that we do have to mention is some things that, that – one thing that Mike Elko brought up, another thing that was just kind of a running conversation piece through this game. One, Mike Elko was very, very emotional, not like in a crying way, but in a, in a forceful way about – calling out people who have called out Connor Wegman, especially with things, personal attacks, things that were true. It's not something that you necessarily see from a coach these days. A lot of times they'll just kind of let those things pass. It was um, notable that he went, went out there and, and dropped an expletive uh, <laughs> uh, talking about how much he didn't appreciate the rumors and things being spread about his quarterback. And the, the other one was the blanket. Yes. They, uh, they was, went around social media last night that somebody left a blanket and a note in uh, Theo Weiss, the wide receiver's room, uh, saying it was from uh, Will the, the Blanket Lee. Uh, it seemed to, he, you know, uh, Theo Lee showed up with a blanket around his shoulders. Right, right. But it, it seemed like, and it, it, from the stats will prove that Will Lee, I think, got the best of that battle. He had a really good game Will, uh, today. Willie did have a good game. Uh, I, that's awesome that you can back that up, even though even if he's not the one that actually <laughs> sent the blanket to him. Just a, a, a funny storyline there. But I asked you last week, after the win against Arkansas, does this change your perspective? Just, does this change your expectations for this team? You said it didn't at the time. Now we're a week later, and they, they beat Missouri. Do your expectations and perspective of this team change? Does it change moving forward? I think I – think my perspective. I, I still, I still need some more evidence uh, to, to see that this is the, the offense, the defense, the way it's going to be. Um, but I think even Nick Sorton kind of mentioned it, and, and Le'Veon Moss kind of mentioned it. I think it does raise the expectations. They come into this game, or come out of this game, leading the SEC. They're three and zero, uh, and they, they, you know, Le'Veon Moss was. Are they a, a, consider themselves a front runner to take the SEC? And he said yes. But there's still a lot more football to play. Right. Um, I think everybody is. I, I think the the conversation after this game, regardless of what Missouri turns out to be, is the fact that AM is probably going to be in a little bit of that conversation of who's in that upper echelon of of SEC schools. I still think, as Le'Veon Moss said, they have a lot to prove. But uh, you know, with Ole Miss taking a loss last week, with Oklahoma sputtering, uh, who's going to challenge? Uh, for the, some of those top spots in the SEC, I think A and M has entered the conversation with this win. Yeah, tra tra Travis Brown, the skeptic, we'll call it. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, they'll uh, 
uh, we said before the, the season that the schedule is very favorable. This, to me, was one that was a big um, kind of uh, checkpoint in the mm -hmm. season for them to, to, to really see where they are, and they proved themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, yeah, when you look at the favorable schedule moving forward, um, it only makes you wonder you know, what this team is, is actually capable of. But you know, Texas A&M coming off that 41-10 to win here at Kyle Field, moving into the bye week next week before they hit the road to take on Mississippi State on October 19th. Reporting for Travis Brown, I'm Tyler Shaw.